Welcome, welcome, welcome to The Living Room, where we listen, learn, and live together. I'm your host, Richard Martin. Glad you're here. Make yourself right at home. I hope your day's going well, enjoying the spring weather. I can say that this week is starting off on the right foot for me. The weather was beautiful outside. In fact, I'm a little bit tired and rested at the same time because I was able to get out and go for my first run of this running season. What is the running season, you may ask? Well, it's different for everybody, but my running season begins when the weather feels right for running to me. And it felt great out there today, a little over 70 degrees, and I ran just over two miles as my introductory run for this season. And so I'm looking forward to building mileage, building strength, and building endurance so I'm feeling great, feeling, feeling, what's the word I want to use? I was going to say cardio Can I make that up? I'm feeling cardio I'm benefiting from the cardio that I got in earlier today. And in addition to that, my pretty girl, my wife and I started a four-week fitness challenge, free four-week fitness challenge with our coaches in California, the coaches of One Body Fitness LA. Go look them up, check them out. Today was day one. This is our third four-week fitness challenge with them. We did the first one last year, the second one to start the year, and now to start this second quarter of 2021, we are doing it again. And I'm kind of feeling it in my shoulders, feeling it in my calves. It was a full body 20 minute workout. And uh, no, no weights, just body weight, no repeat, about 15, 16 exercises all the way through. So I'm feeling rested uh, as a result of the exercise. And I'll be honest, I took a little nap, <laughs> but I'm also feeling a little tired as a result of it. But it's a good tired. And that's how my day has gone. That's how my week is beginning. What about you? How's your day going? What's the weather like where you are? And what are you doing to add to your mental, emotional, spiritual, and physical health? Today, I'm eager to have our conversation. We're going to talk about research, reunions, and running. But before we talk about those three things, I want to thank you, thank you, thank you for subscribing to the channel, for liking and sharing and commenting our conversations. I know that you and others are being inspired by them even as I am. And as a result of your listenership and support, this week we reached 1,000 subscribers. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I appreciate you. And if you're listening and haven't subscribed yet, I humbly invite you to do so at this time. Press the like button, press subscribe, press the bell button that you can get notified when we drop our weekly videos. Big kudos to you. Couldn't do this without you, and I appreciate you very, very, very much. So research, reunions, and running. I'm not sure if I've shared this with you intentionally or directly, but I think I might have mentioned it in passing. I am completing a doctoral program. I'm at Boston University, a doctoral student in their doctorate of ministry program in transformational leadership. I am currently completing my last class. At the time of this recording, I submitted a weekly um, discussion board post as well as a group, a group, small group question. And the program is going well so far. Thankful to all of my colleagues. Uh, shout out to you all, as well as my friends who have been supporting me, my wife, my family. It's been an enjoyable experience so far, a, transform a transformative experience so far, uh, and one that I am grateful to be on. Now, I am researching clergy health. Clergy wellness is my field of specialty, my concentration field. In fact, right here, I have, I have with me, uh, you can't see all the lines, but this is a portion of my project proposal my dissertation proposal. I am in the process of writing it and revising it, I should say. Just received the most recent draft back from my advisor with some robust comments. Robust is a word he likes to use. Robust comments that I am to internalize and make the necessary changes in my document. And I want to talk about that particular experience for a little bit, just getting to this point in research, uh, some of the challenges that I've had to navigate recently, and also what I'm hoping for the future. When I arrived at Boston University in the fall of 2019, 
I was not too sure what my area of focus would be. I knew that I wanted to either do church revitalization or church renewal. And I had interest somewhat in the clergy health arena, but what was primary on my mind when I arrived at Boston University was church revitalization, pastoring a small church, a church that has had a, like many churches, an experience that could be described as high and low. There was some mountaintop seasons and then some valley seasons, some times of uncertainty, and then times of great clarity before I arrived. And so upon my arrival, I was able to glean a lot of the history from the members. So by the time I went to Boston University, about two years after I arrived at the church where I'm currently pastoring, I knew that church renewal, church revitalization could be something that I would be interested in studying. And so my first few research papers actually focused in that area. But it didn't really stick. It didn't grab me. It wasn't something that I was so passionate about in an academic sense that I wanted to write on it extensively. Practically, yes, I am very much into church renewal and church revitalization. But when it comes to scholarship and contributing to that field, I I I'll be honest, if they suggest that you ought to do something that you're passionate about in that area, as a lot of my doctoral friends advise me, I knew about the first semester, first semester and change into the program that this wasn't going to be something that could sustain me. But I also knew that clergy health and wellness was inspiring to me. The research, the literature, the testimonies and experiences of others, as well as my own attempts to become a whole person, the best version of Richard Martin that I could be physically, emotionally, spiritually, psychologically, relationally as a man and as a pastor. And so as I begin to read in that field and check out dissertations, journal articles, periodicals, papers that had been written, having conversations with peers and just seeing what was going on, man, it gripped me. And I'll never forget the first paper that I wrote in that field. It was convincing. This is what I want to write about. This is where I want to go. Well, at this point in that field, because that's that's large, right? Uh, clergy health, clergy wellness. What are you focusing on? Physical, emotional, mental. I'm, I'm locating my studies in the emotional and mental space, and I'm seeking to close the gap between pastoral isolation and feelings of loneliness and pastoral peer support, clergy support. Now, social support is broad, and it can be support from one's family, support from one's congregation, support from one's collegial or peer network, support from one's friends. I am clergy health moving from loneliness and isolation to feelings of social support. And in that social support category, I'm focusing on peer support. That is, how can pastors find life in support from their fellow pastors, all right? So that's in development and that's what I am proposing to research. I am writing an 11 to 15 page document that hopefully this month will be approved by the Doctor of Ministry Committee which sends me flying into the wider research field to bring back gold, as it were. And that should be about 100 to 125 pages, um, especially, especially since I am, I am seeking to add to the theory and the literature review a practical intervention, what can be done. So here's what should be done. Here's the vision. Well, first, here's the problem. Then here's the vision. And then here is the practical transformational process I am proposing. Here is the in, here's the transformative process I actually think can get someone, a pastor, from the problem to the vision. And then you talk about how you're going to evaluate that. So that's 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 the runway into where I am. I want to give you a chance to have a backdrop of what brought me to this topic, what brought me to this moment in the program, and what's next. Well. When I first submitted my Doctor of Ministry research proposal, the first draft, submitted it to my advisor, he sent it back to me with a litany of responses, which in a word said, you have not yet clarified what your problem is, and therefore the vision that you've attempted to write seems disconnected from the problem that you've articulated. And I cannot then go on to your transformational process because your problem and your vision do not necessarily align. And so I'll be honest, I was I was a little I was a little deflated, uh, somewhat defeated because you put in a significant amount of work on the front end and then to receive word back that it's not clear. 
that was rough. I don't know if you've ever had that challenge before. Adding to that a, a, a very biographical note, I'm going back into childhood now. Research papers have never been my strong suit. In other words, on one hand, I've I've never really liked doing research papers from the time I was a child in elementary school. I'm not sure. I can't really recall. When do we start doing research papers? Fifth, sixth, seventh grade. It's normally four to five page research paper. Then you graduate to five to 10 and then 10 to 15. And throughout my collegiate experience, my high school journey and even elementary and middle school, um, the bane of my existence has often been research papers. That being said, some of my most exceptional academic moments in terms of feeling fulfilled as a student have actually come ironically on the heels of a research process. I remember two papers in particular. One was second semester freshman year in undergrad and the other one was my last year in undergrad. There were two research papers, both actually historical. One had to do with African-American history proper and then the other had to do specifically with African-American history within the context of my particular uh, denomination, my particular faith community. And I enjoyed the research process for both of them. I was able to have great guidance from my professors at the time. And the product yielded a wonderful product that was graded well. I, I received A's in both of those courses. And outside of them, I've had a few other research endeavors that I've been proud of. But by and large, researching research papers, producing them at least, has been weighty to me. And I think it has a lot to do with I can be destination oriented. And because it's such a tall task, like I am in that right now, 100 to 125 pages, I've never written something that large. How is it going to be done? Even, even now, I have to actively negotiate my feelings about it all so that I'm not overwhelmed with the sense of research paper development anxiety. I give you that backdrop to say, hearing now from my advisor that your first draft, and I know you're probably saying, Rich, come on, man, like when are first drafts of anything ever pristine, spotless, perfect, ready for submission? But I'm just trying to say like how I felt about it was that, man, it was as if nothing that you had written at all made sense. Now that might be a little bit hyperbolic on my part. I don't know. You know how when you when you and your feelings, it kind of colors the the full truth of it all. But I think my advisor was simply trying to get me to see that in order for you to submit this proposal, you want to submit it in a way where not only the proposal committee but someone who's not a pastor could see very clearly. Wow, pastors are experiencing this problem. And in order to describe this problem, Rich, I want you to learn to use what he calls a family of related terms. Instead of just trying to narrow it down to this one singular term, think about this term and that term and those terms and how they all create this multifaceted picture, which really underscores like flashing red lights. Hey, this is a problem. And a reader from the outside of your pastoral world could see it and say, wow, yes, it is. Something needs to be done. And then your vision or your ideal for the future is presented directly out of the problem. This is what it is. This is what it can, should, and I hope will be. And then you explain that to them in a way that says, and they say it needs to be rooted in rich theological soil as well as corresponding social scientific soil. So that's psychology, sociology, and other complementary fields in addition to the theological underpinnings. When they read the vision section, your readers will be able to say, yes, this is better. Now, how do you propose moving a pastor who feels like the problem is described to who is experiencing what the vision has described? And that leads to your third section, your transformational process. Here's how I am proposing it can be done. And then I'll know that a pastor has moved from problem to vision by evaluating her or him according to these measurements. So, so that's, that's, my, that's my objective. But I wasn't near that on my first draft. And it took me a while to build back up the, the confidence the emotional um, fuel that I needed to get back into the fray. Huge shout out to my peers um, in my cohort, but also my peers outside of my cohort. Some of my buddies who have traveled this road before. I can't thank enough my wife. Again, if you, if you hear what I'm saying, social support is very important for me. And I would su suppose that for you it is as well. 
because even though I'm talking specifically about research, this for me just becomes a, 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 a foundation on which to talk about something wider. My endeavor right now is research, but I am supported through this by my community, right? So that in life, we cannot escape having challenges when it comes to some kind of endeavor. For you, it might not always be research. It could be something else, but I can guarantee this. When you've got supporters in your corner, you are buoyed and, and you have a greater sense of, of relational currency to draw upon to get me through. So let me tell you what helped me. There's a friend of mine um, who's reached out to me and was like, yo, Rich, how is your research going? I gave them the Cliff Notes version, far shorter than I've shared with you. Let them know some of the very things that I've been struggling with, a little bit of the anxiety that I was that I was battling. And they said, well, do you need help? Do you need somebody to read your paper? If so, I'd be more than willing to read it, give you some feedback. That way you kind of have a reader in between you and your advisor. Because I think they sense that the whole notion of having an advisor who had so much quote unquote control over your progress and your timeline was a little bit daunting for me at the moment. So I said, sure, no doubt. Once I've completed this renewed draft, I will submit it to you. Now, by the time I submitted to this friend of mine, thankfully, I had some correspondence with my professor and we had a little bit more clarity on which direction I should go, which helped me with the second draft. Submitted it to my friend and they responded in kind. They read it. They said, listen, I see it. It's clear. Now, that same day, I received a message from my advisor with an updated draft and said, listen, I want to commend you because this draft is far more advanced. Oh, that made me feel even better. Now, to, to tell you why hearing from both my advisor and my friend in the same day was so special is because about a week earlier, communication between my advisor and I was not going the best. I, I, I won't get into all the details, but man, it was it was rough. And I've learned the value of communicating well, um, especially via email. And like I said, I won't I won't get into all the, the, the details. Suffice it to say, I shared it with my wife, talked to my dad, my parents about it. And, and they were saying, yeah, man, that, that seems a little off there. We need to pray about it and see how we can develop an opportunity to be able to clarify not just the what of communication, but the how. And I'm grateful that on that day when my friend responded to me and my advisor, it was kind of closing a loop and opening another one. Closing one in the sense of I received some kind of affirmation that I was tracking in the right direction, but it opened now another loop. And here's what I want to say. Today, as I was running, I was listening to a podcast. Two, neuro, two neurologists were talking to Rich Roll. Rich Roll is a podcast host, runner that I listen to and kind of draw inspiration from. And they said, when it comes to the mind processing the need for change, when it comes to the mind processing the need for change, often the mind, when it senses the change will disrupt its current comfort, it sees that invitation as an obstacle as opposed to an opportunity. And man, that provided language and framework for me to process how I had been feeling. On a practical level, when my advisor reached out to me and said, there's more work to be done, you're not yet as clear as you need to be, I'll be honest, I think I first processed that as an obstacle when all it was was an opportunity. In fact, if I were to go down the list of all his comments, I'm coming to see them now as opposed to an obstacle to me uh, saying what I want to say as an opportunity to say what I'm trying to say and learning to say even better and even clearer. And as I thought about that, I thought about how often in our lives, we often have that same opportunity or that same challenge. Are we looking at something as obstacle or as opportunity? And I think that as we continue to live and live into the possibilities going forward, as we become the best version of ourselves, let's start looking at things more as opportunities to gain greater clarity to gain greater strength, to become more proficient and efficient in something, as opposed to criticisms and red marks, as it were. I mean, he's commenting on Word, but just imagine those old red markings. I mean, just my paper was bloodied up, man. This is what you need to change. Here's what I'm suggesting. I'm thinking out loud here. I want you to go back here, do more research. It's an opportunity for me to continue to have the chance to read, to become more, to become more not only clearer, but just to become more of an authority in this field. 
as I'm seeking to become a scholastic advocate of clergy wellness and health, this, this troubleshooting that I'm experiencing right now, even as I'm sharing this with you, it's not over yet. We're just at the phase of I'm trying to present a quality document to the committee to be approved to do a wider research endeavor. So keep me in your thoughts. Keep me in your prayers. I think this research will turn out to be something good. And here's my covenant with you. As the journey goes on, and especially as it nears its ending, and then especially when it's done, here's my covenant to you. I will share with you what has been produced and how it stands the chance to help clergy. And who knows, maybe you're a pastor, or maybe you are a pastor, or maybe you have a family member who's a pastor and you are concerned about their whole health. And if in any way from the vaults of my own experience and from what is produced as fruit from this research endeavor can benefit those pastors in your lives, then, hey, I am here with you and for you. So a couple of days ago, speaking of school, I celebrated with my friends 10 years since graduating from undergrad. Now, let me let me clarify. Let me clarify. Now, it was the class that I entered my undergraduate institution with. It was really their 10 year anniversary and reunion because your boy, I graduated in the fifth year. <laughs> that sounds like a, an introduction to a lot of Bible stories, right? In the fifth year. So long story short, while I was at my undergraduate institution, in fact, I'll go ahead and name it because I ain't shame. I went to the Oakwood University in Huntsville, Alabama. When I arrived with this class in the fall of 2007, it was Oakwood College. During our first semester, they surveyed the student population and the alumni base asking about what they would like, we would like to call this institution because we had reached all of the accreditory requirements to become a university. And so they asked us, do we want to be Oakwood Adventist University, Oakwood College, remain Oakwood College, um, Oakwood University of, I can't remember all the options, but there are about four or five options. And it is now Oakwood University. That was the decision that was made. And so that happened at the beginning of our second semester freshman year. Well, throughout my Oakwood College journey, Oakwood University journey, I was a double major at a certain point. I wasn't just a theology major for about a year. I was theology and English. And that put me on a five year time track, timeline. So by the time I was finished with the trying to get an English major, I had went from major to minor. And then I said, you know what? I just want to get out of here. I ended up finishing in five years instead of four years, because by that time, your boy couldn't get that fifth year back, which turned out to be a blessing. Well, anyways, 10 years, it's been 10 years since that class, that freshman class of 2007 graduated in 2011. And we had a wonderful virtual gathering this past weekend. As you know, the kind of in-person reunions and alumni weekends that we were accustomed to, as many institutions can profess, it, it, it just didn't happen like that. And so late one Saturday evening, we got together on Zoom had a bunch of breakout rooms, a lot of conversations, catching up, seeing what's what, what's not. Man, it was it was fun. And I'll be honest, it has come so quickly. I did not even process that it had been 10 years since my freshman class graduated from college. A number of us graduated, like I said, the year afterwards, 2012, but we still want to hop on because this class represented those that we begun this collegiate journey with. We were able to celebrate with them at that 2011 mark. And, and I told them I'll be back in 2012 to celebrate with my actual graduating class. But we've been able to keep up with a lot of one another over the years. And then there was some, to be honest, as reunions go, I hadn't really seen or corresponded with, save maybe the occasional social media sighting in 10 years. And so I learned some lessons and I kind of already alluded to one of them. One man, time flies. Whether you are on board or not, whether you feel as though it is going too fast, time flies. It has been 10 years already. I remember finishing Oakwood and feeling like 10 years would not go by fast enough. I wasn't rushing it, wasn't eager to skip, leap, and jump to 10 years, but that unit seemed so large, so way out there in the distance. And I blinked and here it is 10 years later. And that refrain kind of kept coming up. Can you believe it's been 10 years? Oh my goodness. I threw out this question rather 
Joe Coastley, I asked, is there anybody else out there besides me who has spotted their first, second, and or third gray hair? And a lot of hands went up. The brothers and the sisters were saying, yep, yeah, I've got a few on my own. Others more than, than some and some a little less than others. But um, if gray hair is any indication that it's been 10 years, then help us for the next five to 10 years. And when I say time flies, I'm not just speaking now in a kind of superfluous way to say, yeah, no, duh, 10 years has gone by quickly. But it just really caused me to reflect on how I want to lean into the next 10 years. And I am definitely not rushing those any more than I have the past 10 years. In fact, I said that and others did too. Uh, what, what, where's so-and-so? Why did they come? And well, maybe next time. And I said, well, I, I am letting next time come. The, the next five years, the next 10 years, those can take their time. But it did cause me to think about the fact that when it comes, I'll probably be saying the same thing with my, with my peers. Time flies. Many of us are married. Several of my peers are parents, um, have moved from place to places. They have finished graduate degrees. And as I was looking, a lot of them are doctors in various fields, entrepreneurs, and I can go on and working for the government, just doing awesome things. And I had to ask myself, OK, when you come back to these reunions, what do you really come? What do you really want to come back with in terms of report? Do you just want to talk about your job scenario? Do you want to talk about the material things that you've acquired? Now, it was positive. There, there wasn't anything that I experienced at my virtual reunion that was off-putting, that was souring. No, no, no. It was, it was great. It was, there were laughs, jokes. In many ways, we picked up where we'd all left off. But on a personal level, I just started reflecting and saying, man, I'm thankful that I'm able to report that I'm pastoring and enjoying pastoring. They they all knew Richard was a theology major at Oakwood. When I would jump in and out of the different breakout rooms of other fields, they would say, you're not a psychology major. You weren't a biology major. But I just came to say hi. Is that a problem? And so after a while, everybody started to mix it up. You didn't just go to your specific major's breakout room. But 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 I was glad to report that my family's doing well. Here's where I'm living and as I thought about it, man, I thought about what one of my, um, what, what an author named David Brooks has said in his book, The Second Mountain. Uh, excuse me. No, that's his second book. He wrote a book called The Road to Character. David Brooks is The Road to Character. And he says, many of us spend the majority of our lives building resume virtues instead of eulogy virtues. Now, I'm not trying to be morbid. I, I don't want to take this down a dark path, but that thought was provoking to me. Am I spending my time developing resume virtues, things that look good on paper, whether or not I am seeking a new job? I could be a pastor for the next several decades and never sit for another formal interview and still try to develop what he calls resume virtues. In other words, those things that are just on the surface. Instead, he said, one who pursues character is one who thinks about the virtues that will be espoused during your eulogy at your funeral. It is, it is definitely a wake up call to, to consider that life, life speeds by and your reunions are just these benchmarks to remind you that no matter what you're doing or who you are, time does not wait on you, doesn't wait on me. And so my 10 year, my entering classes 10 year reunion, <laughs> I'm accepting it as my own, 10 years since they graduated from Oakwood, it puts me in a mindset where I'm saying the next reunion and subsequent reunions, I want to be better, more fit in terms of my character as I go on. That's going to be a benchmark for me. It's a part of my pursuit of becoming a whole person. And I want to invite you to consider doing the same. No, not only for class reunions, high school, middle school, college, graduate school, medical school, you name it not only for family reunions, but just as a part of the economy of your life. When I have check-ins with friends, with peers, old classmates, yes, it's well and good to be able to showcase things that people can see, but also prioritize what people can't see. Let's become stronger in our characters for the next reunion. Lastly, I want to talk to you about running. And as I mentioned to you today, I started uh, my, my first introduction, my inaugural run of this 2021 season. Haven't been outside to run since 2020. 
took a little break, still been focusing on indoor workouts, strength training, hit training. And like I said, today we began a four week fitness challenge, but I got out there today for my first run. My run plan was to stop and walk for a minute every half a mile. And I stuck to that run plan. And one day I'll give you more of a background into my, my foray into the running space. But I, I'll give you this little teaser right now. One of the things that can be difficult for me is to stick to my running plan. That is to say, when I go out, if I'm feeling good, even if my plan was to stop every half mile, I'll say at the first half mile, man, I'm feeling good. I'm going to keep going and, and then forget that I'm probably going to pay for breaking that running plan down the line. But this season, one of my goals is to make my running plans and stick to my running plans because that has a tendency to decrease injury, to, to curb the possibility of burning out. I mean, running is a monotonous exercise, as you know. And so after a while, I don't care if you're the strongest runner, mentally, you can check out if there's no variety or if there's too much variety. And so making a plan and sticking to that plan kind of helps. These are going to be my speed days. This is going to be my long run. I'm just going to stop at every half mile. I'm not doing more than this, even if I feel good. And if I don't feel good, I'm not going to overwork myself. I'd rather get some positive, healthy mileage in as opposed to what my running coach calls junk miles, where you just feel like you've got to get the mileage in. So you're, you're slothfully making it through the run. He'd rather us call it in, get some sleep, come back the next day and try it again, because that's only going to have an adverse effect on you. So as I'm thinking about this running thing, man, again, I'm asking myself, why am I doing it? Right. And I think that with running, one of the most essential tenets or principles to keep in mind is you got to know your personal why. You know what you're doing. You're running. You're running for time. You're running for speed. You're running for endurance. You're running for distance. Um, in this in this virtual running space where there aren't too many in-person events, they're slowly coming back in. You have to ask yourself, why are you doing it? I had to ask myself that at the beginning of this year when I was invited to consider running one of the most historic ultra marathons in the world, the Comrades Marathon in South Africa. This was supposed to be a significant anniversary. I can't remember if it was the 100th year or the 101st Comrades Marathon. Um, but a couple of new friends of mine said, listen, won't you run with us? I told you I hadn't run since 2020. So the notion of commencing a season earlier than you normally would for a distance that you had never run before, which was somewhere around 52 miles, having done three marathons, that is 26.2 miles. I know that is no walk in the park. That's no run in the park. That's no crawl in the park. Okay, I don't care how you cut it, an ultra marathon of that distance is gargantuan. And so I was tempted to, to say, you know what, I'm down for it. But I'm glad I did not, not only because of all the aforementioned things I share with you about research and being a doctoral student, but because I was not able to locate a personal why that would have motivated me to go through the, the just taxing training that would have been necessary to accomplish it. Good, bad news. Good, bad news. Bad news is it was canceled. And the good news might be that it was canceled. But even if it did take place, um, I, I wasn't going to commit to doing that. And so whether or not it's an ultra marathon or simply just trying to get a mile in a day, I'm learning that having a why behind the what helps me commit to the plan that I've made. If I forget that, then it's easy to shift and say, ah, oh, you know, it's good. I I'll get it in tomorrow. I won't get it in at all because I have to come to the point where I realize for me that it's always about more than the run. The run clears my mind. Sermons are developed while I'm running. Thoughts are clarified. As I mentioned already, I listen to podcasts while I'm running and I'm able to absorb things while I'm in motion and, and, it tends to stick with me long term, like those neurologists who shared that idea that when our minds process change, if we sense it's going to disturb our comfort, we can often look at it as obstacle instead of opportunity. Man, I just was repeating that as I was running, almost in cadence with my steps, just kind of internalizing that thought and then allowing it to seep into the areas of my life where for me that might be true. So so running has those kinds of whys underneath it for me. It's not just the physical benefits. But I have to remember, hey, you have clarity when you run. 
Your creativity is inspired when you run. So when you are saying no to running, and I'm not being legalistic to say that there's never going to be a rainy day or a blistering hot day where it might not be safe or advantageous to run. But if you are going to make your plans and stick to them, remember that there are benefits that await the other side. Now, let me say this. Actually, this thought just came to mind. The benefits are not only on the other side of the run, are they? The benefits are also on the front side of the run. I mean, just every component, every process is a part of your accumulation of a successful run experience that it might not just begin when I put my first foot in one foot in front of the other and and start to run or start my Nike running app. And I've got my podcast playing and I've accomplished my distance and I've come back. Maybe it also should include when you just lay your clothes out, when you fill up your water bottle, when you have your energy gels. And whatever else goes along with it, just from the preparation to the run experience, to the cool down, your stretch, your cleanup, you're eating some renewing, replenishing food. Maybe that should be a part of it also. But knowing your why helps you sustain your commitment to your what. For me, it's running as well as research, as well as pursuing character development. And I want to extend to you the opportunity to think about why are you doing anything that you're doing right now? Why aren't you doing what you aren't doing right now? Why helps you remain committed to your what? A clear why gives you a sense of commitment to the what? I want to run for clarity. I want to run for creativity. I am running, yes, for the physical health benefits of it all. But beyond that, I am running because I actually think that developing this consistency is going to have some some awesome benefits when it comes to my pursuit of character development. This research journey allow me to be able to unplug from the paper writing, to be able to detox, as it were, and to gain some health benefits that are going to make me a better person ultimately. So, again, a clear why gives you a more committed what. So there we have it. That's our conversation for today, my friends. I wanted to just come and think out loud with you, wrap back and forth with you on my research journey thus far, my reunion experience, and the commencement of this running season. I'll be checking back and forth with you, checking in back with you on these various topics in subsequent conversations. So you make sure you keep coming back, keep listening in, and I I think you're going to be inspired with me along this journey. Well, that's all we have for this episode of The Living Room. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today, for allowing me the pleasure of keeping you company on your commute and maybe even in your home, just sitting in your living room for a bit. I don't take your presence for granted. If you've not done so already, please do me the kind favor of subscribing and sharing these conversations so that others might be inspired as well. Till next time, my friend, continue to listen, continue to learn, and continue to live.